Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the very first 2024 Tech Tactics Live. This is episode 83, and tonight we're going to be talking about car appraisals. But before I uh, introduce our guests, I want to make sure we thank Pirelli. Without their sponsorship, none of this would happen. I also want to thank uh, Manny and Robert, who are actually behind the scenes. And if you took a look at the intro to tonight's episode, it's new for 2024. And of course, all the agendas and the setup, um, those two really make it happen. And I just want to make sure I thank them. And of course, I want to remind you to please like, subscribe and comment. We are just shy of 85,000 subscribers on YouTube and you can make a difference by just hitting that subscribe button. And if you're watching tonight with us live, be sure to ask questions and monitor uh, the live chat area because we've got a lot of action going on there. So tonight we're talking about car appraisals and our guest, a 24 year PCA member, member of the Chesapeake region, as well as the Everglades region, I hear. But more importantly, he's a certified appraisal Razor. Welcome to the show, Doug Eman. Doug, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Boo. Nice to be here. All right, so let's um, let's just get right started and throw up the agenda, Robert, and just let folks know what we'll be going over tonight. We're going to be talking about why do you need an appraiser? What do you use it for? What are the different types of appraisals are there? What does an appraiser inspect? What's diminished value and how can an appraiser help you in that uh, area? And of course, uh, now that you've decided you need one, how to find one and what qualifications are you going to look for? I know just like every other show we do, we only have an hour and it's going to go very quick because we just had uh, dinner and I had a wealth of questions and we had like a pre-show meeting and uh, that could have gone an hour. So let's just jump right into it. Why do people even need an appraiser? Well, there are all kinds of reasons, uh, either to hire an appraiser or do some appraisal work on your own. And in fact, during this discussion, I'll describe some methods people can use themselves to do valuations on their cars. But there are lots of uh, different types of appraisals. Often they're done for insurance reasons, uh, for an estate. Someone's passed away and has a collection of cars and needs to know what they're valued to settle the estate or to pass the assets on to heirs. Uh, maybe it's a divorce and an asset distribution. Uh, maybe they're trying to get a, a loan or collateral for a loan, uh, a donation or a gift to a museum, or a bankruptcy, or maybe a pre-purchase appraisal where someone's far away and wants someone to take a look at a car and really get their eyes on it and go through it in detail before they decide to buy. Now, how often are the people that are coming to you looking for an appraisal, are they under like duress? Like it's something they need to do really quickly and you know how should people uh, plan for that? I, it, sometimes it, it's kind of last minute but most of the times they're pretty well planned ahead. Uh, the estates sometimes need to be settled quickly um, but in most cases people come with enough lead time that it's easy to kind of work them into a schedule. So with Porsches and the market that we've experienced in the last five years yeah. You know, uh, those of us that are lucky enough to own a Porsche, we've kind of noticed their values go up and up and up. And you know, we always talk about uh, making sure you have the right amount of coverage with your insurance policies. Does that play in with what you do? Yeah, it definitely does. And uh, I'll just talk a moment about insurance. I know there have been some uh, uh, sessions that you've had on insurance before, but there are different types of policies. And you really, if you have a nice collectible car, like I'm sure a lot of the users and, and uh, viewers do, you want an agreed value insurance policy. So in that case, you're agreeing with the insurance company on what the cost is or the value of the vehicle is. 
And if there's a total loss, a fire, or it's stolen, then that's what they'll pay out. Uh, if you don't have that, then it may be a value determined uh, typically by the insurance company, and it's depreciated. And uh, just a quick example on that, I've been working with a guy just this week who has a uh, uh, 1987 Mustang that he bought for not very much, but then he put $74,000 into uh, build it into a beautiful race car, big wow. engine and blower and suspension and all kinds of things. And it was stolen. Oof. And the insurance company said, well, it's an, it's an 87 Mustang. It's worth, I think, like $11,000. And he said, my gosh, I just put all this money in. And so uh, his insurance policy was such that he could hire me and go through an arbitration process with the insurance company. And I think he's probably going to settle for a lot more than maybe four or five times at least uh, what the insurance Now you mentioned that the car was stolen. How do you appraise a car that's not even there? Well, it's, it's tougher to do it that way, but he had a lot of photos. He'd done a wonderful job building this car and had photos of the process. And then he had, uh, I, gosh, I think we had about 100 pages of receipts ah. that we then captured all the items that he had put on the car and, and the insurance company respected that. And I have a way of depreciating it uh, from the, the uh, date that he purchased these to the day the loss occurred. So that's a, that's a great tip. I mean, a <laughs> lot of us, you know, we talk about when you're working on your car and keeping records and such and receipts, right. sometimes you don't want to look at all the receipts together because then it scares you. But in this case, <laughs> him keeping all the receipts is going to work out for him. Yes. Yep. Very good. So what about, um, you know, what other instances, you know, people are going to consider bringing an appraiser kind of into the scene. Um, you know, I think of like a, a, an accident mm -hmm. um, and someone has hit your car and now how do you determine your value of your car after it's been hit and after it's been repaired? And That's a good question and something we'll kind of touch on toward the latter end of the presentation here. But diminished value is the law in most states in the U.S. And it allows uh, someone who's had a total loss, an accident caused by another party, to um, claim an amount that the, that the vehicle has lost in value because now it has this accident history. Mm -hmm. And the accident history, it can be seen on uh, Carfax or auto check reports. And uh, if you take it into a dealer or CarMax or a knowledgeable buyer, they can look it up and see that it's had this history. So they're going to be a lot less interested in a that car than one that doesn't have this accident history. So the diminished value compensates you for that in addition to the repair cost um, of the vehicle. Now when someone like yourself comes into the picture to understand the value of the car, you know, there's thankfully with, you know, internet and auctions out there and classified sections that mm -hmm. are aligned, like some people could technically go out there and kind of find sure. an equivalent of their car, but what does an appraiser bring to the table that you know a normal person like me wouldn't be able to find? Well, uh, and I, I encourage people, if they'd like to do their own valuations, uh, to do that, and it can be helpful, and a lot of times the insurance companies will accept that uh, for insurance purposes or for a total loss, uh, but a lot of times the insurance companies want a certified appraiser to do the work, uh, provide a complete report that has a lot of detail about the the vehicle, the accident, the repair work that needs to be done if it's a total loss, uh, the, the why it's a total loss, and and then do a valuation based on uh, reputable sources and credible sources. So. so we have a few questions here. And again, those of you that are watching live with us tonight, I encourage you to use the live chat area to ask questions and we'll run through. Um, here's a question from Northern Car Guy from Canada. Okay. It says, uh, do different areas of Canada and U.S. have different values of Porsches? For example, my 75 911, is it worth more in Florida than it is in Western Canada? Uh, somewhat. And, and some of the valuation sources that we'll talk about, you, you can put a zip code in for the area that the vehicle is either resident in or would be sold in. And there are differences in values. Um, uh, maybe a little less so because a lot of our Porsches, particularly the really valuable ones, are going to be advertised to a national audience perhaps, mm -hmm. either on, uh, you know, in Panorama or in um, uh, PC Market or uh, some of the auction sites and so forth. And so it's a little less critical in that regard. But 
uh, it is always wise to look at some local sources too. Okay. Um, here's a question from Anil Mangaru. Uh, I'm curious, is there a difference between the appraisal that's done for guaranteed value on my classic car insurance versus appraisal done before the sale? Uh, well, both of them are to come up with a good fair market value. And so they, they really shouldn't be uh, different. The value shouldn't be different. Uh, if you're buying or selling, you want to know what the fair market value is, and that's what the insurance company is going to want to know, too. Okay. Here's a question from G. Lehman, and this is a, one of our uh, sponsors, partners. Is the Haggerty Valuation Site an accurate place to assess value of your vehicle? You know, that's a great question. It is a good site. Uh, we'll talk about valuation resources in a minute, and I've got some examples, and Haggerty is one of those, so mm -hmm. uh, we'll touch on that. So um, just look back up to your, your background. Uh, I believe this is, I would say, a second career because you kind of were able to meld your hobby of cars and the, the concord world and knowing cars in and out with the business and you kind of put that two together is that the normal sort of uh, path for an appraiser it, or? It, yeah it can be there are quite a few that i know that have taken that kind of path for me it was a kind of a logical one i really have always enjoyed um, car clubs and cars and and uh, porsches in particular and so uh, i was a, a concord judge in our region for many many years uh, also with some other car clubs and the uh, car show business is a lot like the appraisal business. You're looking for a lot of the same kinds of things mm -hmm. as you assess the car, its condition and value. Um, but I've been involved with cars forever and restored cars and uh, have a lot of fun with them. So it, it was a nice uh, business for me. It's a lot of fun. I meet a lot of interesting people and see a lot of fun cars. <laughs> so what kind of volume, let's say, do you normally do? Like how many appraisals have you done? And uh, I, I, I keep uh, fairly busy, about as busy as I'd like to be. It's a nice business because I can kind of throttle it a little bit uh, up and down. And uh, I do about, uh, about 120 a year on average over mm -hmm. the course of the years that I've been doing it. So, And we've been talking, you know, at, at dinner uh, when it comes to valuations of cars and you know, how do you explain to people that you're trying to take the subjectiveness out of it and you're trying to utilize data to come to the conclusion? That's a great question. Uh, as a, an appraiser I, and a certified appraiser, I need to follow the uniform standards for professional appraisal practice, which applies to people doing appraisals of uh, homes, artwork, and cars. So there are a number of standards that need to be met and they involve uh, uh, ethics properly representing the asset being sold or purchased or insured and in particular a big discussion upon using uh, valuation data on which to base the calculations so I have a variety of data sources I use and apply to different kinds of vehicles mm -hmm. and uh, therefore provide a good data-based fact-based um, valuation so we've talked about in past uh, Tech Tactics Live as well as on our podcast about condition ratings. Yeah. So I think it's probably important for us to reiterate what a number one car is, yeah. what a number two car is, and what you think your car might be, right? Let's bring up slide number five because that addresses that pretty nicely, I think. Slide number five, if you don't mind, Robert. So there's a, a six-point scale that this slide shows. Most of the industry sources use this scale. There are some that go on a one through four scale, but uh, this is pretty standard. And a number one car is an excellent vehicle and is just almost showroom perfect as a, you know, either that or completely restored and just came out of the restoration. Uh, I'd say less than 5% of the cars I see are number ones. Mm -hmm. And in fact, one of my these are like Concorde ready cars. Yeah, at top, 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 of top level, yep. top level. Yeah. One of my favorite uh, quotes attributed to Jay Leno is, when I picked up my Rolls Royce at the uh, restoration shop, it was a number one. And by the time I drove it home, it was a number two. <laughs> so twos are fine cars and they're very similar to ones, but they have been driven some. They do show a little bit of wear, but they're really nice cars. Clean I think, I think most people hope that they have a number two car, but the reality is most people have a three and four car. Yeah, uh, that's true. Most of the cars you see at car shows are threes and fours, threes and fours. which are nice cars. They're, yeah. And if you bring that slide up one more time. Um, so these, these are all my cars. I put them there so I could kind of pick on my own. But uh, 
The number one was a fully restored car, 10-year restoration, every single nut and bolt, plated, repainted, replaced. It actually started as the number six car down in the corner, that pile of parts. I that was the it. car originally? Yeah, I bought oh, that wow. on, uh, on eBay and then spent all that time putting it together. And it's, it's won a couple national car shows and so forth as a number one. But I'll tell you, now that I've been driving it, it's become a number two. Mm. The number two is also a nut and bolt restoration that I did, but it's quite a bit older. It's showing you know, a couple little creases on the leather seats and a few things, but it's a, it's a really nice car. Mm -hmm. uh, number three is a, an 84 911 that uh, it's, it's won some uh, car shows, uh, concourse shows. It's a very good car, but it has, again, you can tell that it's an 84 with its original paint starting to show a little bit. Um, and, and as you were saying, Boo, this is typical of what you see, a, you know, a really nice car. Mm -hmm. And then if we go to number four, let's see, there we go. Uh, that's a good car. It's uh, it almost always, well, it's always in drive, drivable condition. And, but this one, this is an Amphicar, and it's got a couple little rust bubbles in places, and, and uh, there was a dent where it hit the dock once when I <laughs> had it in the water. So uh, it, it's a good car. And then number five is restorable. We can, there we go. Uh, this may or may not be running, but it's usually complete, mm -hmm. and it's in pretty good shape but it needs a little bit of work, and that's a, a 1962 Triumph Spitfire race car. Uh, I bought it with the, uh, the motor was out, and it needed you know, new tires, and there are chips in the paint from its racing history and so forth, uh, but it was fully restorable. And then number six was at the bottom. That's a, uh, a, definitely a parts car. It may or may not uh, ever see the road again. may just be used for parts. So I first heard of you know, condition one through six, through my, you know, discussions with Haggerty and such, like, did they develop that, or who developed developed that condition? Uh, I, I don't know where the origination was, but a lot of these valuation sources that we'll mention use it. Yeah. Uh, or, or you can map this kind of scale onto mm -hmm. theirs. Because it's interesting that they chose one through six and not like one through ten or one mm -hmm. through five or yep. or whatever. So, but it's it's good for people to know. <laughs> you know, most people. Think their cars are two, <laughs> like I said. That's but true. most nice cars are threes and fours, fact, and that's okay. I was just flipping through Panorama, looking in the one ads, and there are a lot of twos. Like the yeah. majority of the cars are twos. And yeah. I'm sure they're nice cars, but you know, they're some of them have a lot of miles two. on them, and and they're probably not really twos. Yeah. <laughs> Let's take a couple more questions from our viewers here. We have Jim B. Uh, with a question here: Would an accident that occurred? as a result of hitting an animal that was fully repaired and paid by the insurance impact the car value? Uh, well, from a diminished value standpoint, it's an uninsured motorist. That deer didn't have an insurance policy. How so, dare it not have insurance? So, right, so you can't do anything. <laughs> it typically can't do anything with um, uh, diminished value, although I just did a Tesla about three weeks ago, and they were able to claim it through their insurance policy. But uh, the... If the repairs were done really well, particularly using original parts, uh, and the car looks the way it was, then it won't hurt the value too much. But it will but there's probably still a negative, carry this. It'll, it'll carry a little bit, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, if you look up, uh, particularly on a more modern kind of car, if you look up in Carfax, you're going to see that it had a you know, minor, moderate, or severe accident, and that's going to make some buyers a little shy. Okay. Well, here's one where uh, someone may have... Uh, instead of uh, an incident with an animal that they didn't anticipate, but Alberto Santa Maria asks, how about mods like exhaust, aero body kits? Could that affect the value of the car? Uh, it, it can. In fact, there's a slide that will come up later talking about uh, resto mods and outlaw cars and so forth. And, and they used to be frowned upon more than they are now. I mean, a lot of mm -hmm. people really enjoy those, and the values are, have been up. But... Anytime you're changing things that aren't original, or particularly changing things that can't be changed back, back to be original, yeah. you're potentially hurting the long-term volume in particular. Okay. Here's a great question. I knew this was going to come up, and this comes from G. Lehman. It seems like patina and unrestored vehicles have been preferred recently rather than fully restored cars. Is this a trend, or will it remain the standard? Well, that's a good question. I think it is a trend. Uh, there, there's a, a group of people who really like 
you know, barn fine kind of cars that yeah. are just the way they were when they were put away. And the originality part, you know, you, as many people say, you can only have an original car, original once. Yeah. And these cars are that way. Uh, but a lot of people, you know, want a car that's cleaned up and, that, and restored and that they can really drive and we, enjoy. We've seen some instances on Bring a Trailer where a uh, 356 Speedster that is more patinaed go for a well more yeah, than a car surprising. that's fully restored. That's unbelievable I, to me. I don't know if it's a trend that's going to continue, but it certainly is a trend now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. So let's talk about, you had some photos of some sort of unique situations of uh, why they called you uh, for okay, the appraisal. Sure, Do you sure. want to hit up some of those photos? Uh, you know, maybe I'll hit the valuation resource part first okay, before we get into those, because yep. I think this might be of interest to people who are particularly interested in looking at values on their own to see what their okay. car may be worth. And you can do a lot of this without hiring an appraiser. So there are lots of valuation resources. This slide shows that. The, uh, some standards for more modern kinds of cars and some collectible cars, but not a lot, are uh, NADA, JD Powers, uh, probably the largest. It's a very respected valuation source. Uh, I do some expert witness work, and in courts of law, NADA is always respected. Uh, Kelly Blue Book and Edmonds are also good sources. Folks mentioned Haggerty. Haggerty is uh, one of a number of insurance companies that uh, we use. It's a, they have a very large and extensive database that is collected from input from their uh, uh, insured customers. Sometimes as people buy or sell cars, they'll give them the, the price that they paid. Um, and they get from other sources as well. But it's pretty good pretty good database. I think they're a little high sometimes because people often insure their cars for a little more a maybe little than more. they yep. should. So they tend to be just a little on the high side. Collection car auction results are another good way to come up with some values. You can either look at these individually, a lot of them are on TV and so forth, but there are some sites that aggregate auction uh, results across the country and around the world. There's one called uh, hammer price that I find to be useful and you mm. can look up specific types of cars and it'll show what they went by auction. Uh, eBay for a lot of cars, it's surprising how many cars are bought and sold on eBay. And you can search on eBay for a completed listing so you can see what they sold for, not just cars that are for sale now. I'll talk about uh, Bring a Trailer in a minute. Another good source, very popular website that has done extremely well uh, before the pandemic and during and since. There are some magazines that have valuations. Uh, Sports Car Market is one that has a lot of good foreign car mm -hmm. results, auction results, descriptions of the cars. Uh, Hemmings Motor News is an interesting one. Maybe people are familiar with this. The phone book. That's right. This is the but original. They're, they're also online and searchable, and there are actually more listings than that. Yeah. And you can look up some completed listings in the, in, uh, on the Hemmings site. And the Panorama is good. I mentioned that earlier. There are lots of uh, classifieds in the back. And the, the PCA Mart mm -hmm. is an excellent uh, resource, too. So Yeah, yeah especially many, when you many. can go and use a search tool on the PCA Mart and find your exact model. If you're looking for Panamera values or Cayenne values, just put in the keyword and all the ones that are in the database pop up and you can kind of try to find one that kind of matches to your car. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, that's... that's and, and the evaluation issues that you have are quite good mm. by, by type, so. Okay. Uh, other sources are, I've got my own database or specialty sites and some of the other club publications are, are good. So let's look at some examples quickly. Can we go on to the next slide, slide seven? Let's see. This is going to bring up uh, NADA, JD Powers. Here's the value of a 1984 uh, 911. They have low retail, average retail, and high, val high retail values, which kind of equate to uh, about a, a high is probably like a two or, or three plus. Average is like a three, four car, and low is is um, like a four car. And you can see quite a range of values. The high value is 76,000, the low is 35. So this goes back to your point, Vu, about um, condition being so critical, mm -hmm. knowing the condition of your car and fairly assessing it. So. Yeah, and I think one of the things to keep in mind is, you know, this is a generalization for, was it, what year was it, 84? Mm -hmm. 84, mm -hmm. 911 Carrera, but within 19, 84, a 911 Carrera, there's 
There's also, you know, special yeah. options. Your M491s, Coupes, or, or, Coupes right. Targas, Cabriolets. Like, this is just a starting point. And, and when I do an appraisal, and if you have them done, uh, the appraisal should include a good description of the vehicle, its VIN number, any identifying numbers, mm -hmm. of course, the odometer, uh, relevant data about the car, also an evaluation of the exterior, the interior, the engine compartment, the chassis, using those codes to, to rate it and then the valuations. But that homework has to be done before you can look up the values. Yeah, okay. If you'd go to um, slide eight, please. So Haggerty, Haggerty again has this terrific database. Here's the same car. You can see their number one car is 128,000. Wow. And their, their uh, number four car is 39,000. So I mean, uh, there's probably a little bit on the high side of that number one, but Again, we have to remember number one cars are spectacular. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so you can see this kind of falls in line when you look at the, you think about two, threes, and fours and how they fit into this scale. Kind of falls in line with what we saw before. The funny thing is I read this and I think most people that have an 84 911 was like, oh yeah, mine's not a number one, but it's probably only about $10,000 less than 128,000. <laughs> right. So I've got a six figure 84 911. <laughs> That's not the case. <laughs> well, not always. Now, if you also look at that slide one more time, uh, the nice thing about Haggerty too is they have historical data. So you can see trends and you can see how the, the value you know, ran up there in uh, during the pandemic and in, mm -hmm. in 2022 and how it's dropped off just a little bit as the economy has soured some in the past few months yeah it leveled off and even you see the the second row it's dropped a little bit but it's still higher than before the pandemic yep. so it's still yep. positive in, indeed yeah and porsches did well during that period absolutely uh so those oh let's go to one more the next slide is nine and that's bring a trailer and this is an interesting site. I don't know if everybody's familiar with Bring a Trailer, but they have become very popular as a place to uh, advertise your car and, and to buy. Uh, a lot of my customers have gone through Bring a Trailer. I have myself both to buy and to sell. You can search by type of car. So here's this the same uh, uh, model period of 9-11. And it brought up this nice chart, the, the black dots, in the chart are sold cars. So that's the price it's sold for, including their uh, uh, fees. Mm -hmm. And you can put your cursor on one of those dots and it will come up with a description of that car. So you can see there's one that went for uh, 250,000. You could bring that up and see that it's, you know, some spectacular, you know, 10 Same. mile yeah. turbo. <laughs> and so the key is to kind of go through those and find cars that match your year, model, and, and condition. condition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's nice. And you can see a little bit of trending there, too, over time. And, and the individual, uh, if you really click on them, you'll see nice descriptions of each one. The key here is, though, you have to be careful not to cherry pick the comps, to pick you know, the best ones and say, gee, that, that uh, $250,000 car is exactly like mine. It may or may not be. Right, so. right. But it should be truly a comp, <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> not a right. wish. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Uh, so there are other valuation sources too. We mentioned a lot of them, but uh, it really depends on the car you have to, to pick the right combination of these sources to look up data on your car. All right. So you were talking about uh, some examples, and I have a number of photos that kind of uh, show when it's good to have an appraisal on some of these kinds of vehicles and the types of appraisals. Let's do it. Yeah, so we bring up slide 11. This is the very first one I did, a Model T. It was lots of fun. The guy said, do you want to drive it, which I typically don't do unless it's a pre-purchase. And I said, sure. So that was a lot of fun. But this was for an insurance purpose, and he had you know, no idea what it was worth and how to insure it. So How does someone get into a car like that and not know how much <laughs> it's worth? Was it gifted to him or something? Yeah, it had been in the family a okay, long time. Okay, okay, yeah, I figured yeah. as much. If we go to the next one. So I see a lot of Porsches, a lot of beautiful cars. Uh, this was also for insurance purposes. And again, it's important to identify uh, you know, the, the features, models, options, just like you were talking yeah. about too. And this car, you know, an 87 930, you know, a decade ago, you probably could have gotten into that car maybe in the 40s, 50s, yeah. but now it's well Oof. over 100. Yep, Easily, yep. right? 
Would have been a good investment. But it's literally the same car parked in the same spot. That's right. Like it, the car hasn't changed at all. That's what to but tell the, your spouse. I, I, I bought this car. I was so was smart. 40, 000, now it's 100000 So I was so smart. Uh, Ooh, this is interesting. Yeah, this was an estate. A, a gentleman had passed away. He'd had this in a garage for years and oh. years and years. It had some, uh, I think, garage damage that that lower... Uh, oh, is it where left. the dust is disturbed? Yes. Is that like a, someone backed a, into a, it? A big dent, yeah. Oh. But it was otherwise a nice car. It had been sitting a long time. The tires were flat and, you know, hoses and wires and things and fuel lines need to be Please don't tell changed. me that car was local, like in Maryland or something. Yeah, there was. It was? Mm -hmm. Oh. Yep. Oh. So uh, this was for an estate. They needed to settle the estate. They, there are a number of... Uh, uh, kids in the estate and and it was going to go to one but the other kids wanted to make sure that you know were they getting a real expensive car or not and make yeah. sure the distribution of the assets was fair I see I see but did it stayed in the family uh, they're considering selling it I that was the last I uh -oh. heard this has been a few years okay a few years <laughs> <laughs> uh, 928 another big estate a, a gentleman in his early 60s suddenly passed away he had about I think it was 35 cars. Wow. This was one. It, the family had thought that it was a prototype 928 because it had a lot of special features. It's got some very unique bodywork that I've never seen. Yeah, before. but it turned out it was a, a highly modified car by mm -hmm. a company in Germany. Mm. But uh, did it, that hurt the value, or it? it well, they thought it was a, a one of a kind or a small number of prototypes, uh -huh. and it wasn't that. The owner probably told them that when they bought it, or told the family, this is a very unique car. I, which I, it is a unique car, it, but it was. it's not it was necessarily a, a factory prototype. It was a beautiful car, and I yeah. saw some of the uh, literature the guy had, in a, had kept in a file. And um, he, unfortunately, did think it was one of these prototypes that was sold that way. Mm. Uh, TR6, right? Nice little TR6, yep. We go to the next. This, here's a uh, Corvette Resto Mod, or we might call it an Outlaw. Mm. It, uh, is, it was a very nice car. Uh, had a new LS, LS motor in it, new suspension, brakes, stereo, all kinds of things. And a lot of Corvette people want these cars to be kept exactly the way they were. And there's a big movement in the hobby for authenticity. Mm. So this goes against that. But... In recent years, these resto mods, uh, a lot of people want all the modern features, both Features, performance yeah. and safety. Yeah, we uh, definitely in our local shows, and in Porsches included, you start seeing, um, you know, long long hoods and stuff with sort of modern drivetrains and everything in it. Yes. Um, so that people can be more comfortable or even just keep up with modern day traffic. Yep. You know, they've equipped with bigger motors in a 356, disc brakes all around and stuff like that. So, exactly. so in this case, did, did the... The resto mod outlaw part of it hurt the value of the car, uh, or did it, it add? Or did well, it, it it was probably worth more than a stock car would have been. I did this a few years ago, but he had put a, an enormous amount of money in to create this resto mod, mm. and it I don't think he could get his money back out of it. Yeah. But uh, but it was a valuable car, and I prized by a lot of people. I think. Mm. Very good. Go to the next one. So if you make a donation to a museum, and this is uh, Whitney Houston's 86 Rolls Royce Silver Spur, and it went to the Antique Automobile Club of America Museum in Hershey, PA, and uh, so the donor was able to claim the value of the appraisal uh, as, as donation. Wow. It was so kind that, of fun to see. So that car looks like it's a limo, even. It's not a standard. It, it was. Yep. It was, it was a, very a limo. Unique car. Yep. Huh. And she had had it for many years and drove it a long time. <laughs> wow. So the next one, actually also from the uh, museum, and the reason I put this in is this car wasn't worth a lot, and the woman who, who owned it, after driving 170,000 miles, had it fully restored. It was beautiful. <laughs> it was a number one car, and it was in the museum, and it was surrounded by, I think there was a Lamborghini on the left and something else all around it, and... Um, but everybody wanted to see this because this is the car that they grew up with. That is so that funny that you said family. you said in the same sentence, condition one car and Ford Escort. <laughs> that was. I never thought I would hear that sentence. Yeah, it was. But yeah, it, everyone, it was just so many people can relate to that car, right? Like right. someone in the neighborhood had one, or you went to, you know, someone took you to My high mom school, took or, me to yeah, school or someone. In this, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I love those kind of cars, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. 
So the next slide just shows lots of fun cars and, and in all different kinds of conditions, motorcycles. There's a um, show bike down on the bottom that was beautiful. I think There's it had maybe Pantera. one mile, Pantera. Panteras are interesting because they had so many problems when they first came out that they were pretty heavily modified and have been through the years. But the, uh, the owner group likes them modified. Yeah, like and I know there's probably a person much less listening critical. right now by the name of Paul Gentili that has a Pantera. And if his car wasn't modified, it probably wouldn't be running. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> a little dig at Paul. You're welcome, Paul. <laughs> Next. Oh, boy. So another reason to do uh, these is a pre-accident appraisal. What was it worth just before it was hit? Oof. This was a total loss. Sometimes the pre-accident appraisals can help people determine a value such that it doesn't get totaled or they want to make sure that if it is totaled, um, it's a fair price. In this case, this guy bought this car back. It was a total loss. He bought it back and uh, I believe it's been restored. So but a he, car like that, like you think modern cars of when they're, they're a total loss and they have a salvage title. So in, in this case, a car like that, it's been totaled. He buys it back. Does that car also have a salvage title? Yeah. Then? When he buys it, it'll have a salvage title, and then he can have it uh, restored and inspected again to, for safety, and it could get a new title. But it'll always have that. It'll have that bad mark forever. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Huh. Let's see. The next one, uh, another total loss. I've had a number of customers that had uh, fires. In this case, one car. Another guy, uh, he had a beautiful garage with like six cars in it and it caught on fire and they were all lost. Oh, no. So this is another good reason why you want to have an agreed value policy so there's no question what you're going to be paid if it is a total loss. Mm. Uh, a modern car, a pre-accident appraisal, the same kind of thing. Um, a little less critical to have agreed value because the the value probably is following along its depreciated number that the insurance company and the supply made. of that car is plentiful right yep yep yeah. uh here's another pre-accident appraisal this was a uh, a baker electric car that had been rebodied onto a uh, model t it was on a car carrier and the car, car carrier went through a parking lot and oh, there was no. a high tension line a low and uh, he took the top of it off oh and uh, this was a total loss, but he did rebuild it. It was quite expensive to have the, the curved glass around it and so forth, and it was pretty expensive, but, uh, okay, but he so, got a good settlement. So how do you find comps for a 1924 Model T? <laughs> yeah, and, and that was tough because of this Baker Electric. So uh -huh. I think in this case, I started with uh, kind of the base prices of both of those cars to kind of see what they should have been. Mm -hmm. And then I was able to find some similar modified cars, either like this or modified in similar kinds of ways, and then come up with a value. Okay. Uh, next slide. Uh, so fraud, I, I, this comes up every once in a while. Here's a, a guy with this 1966 Ford Thunderbird, and he and his wife had had this car nicely restored but it had all kinds of problems. So he'd be driving along and the top would start to come down and the panel would come back and so forth while he's on the road. Or in the upper right photo, there's the steering wheel and there's a lever on these cars that allows the steering wheel to turn 90 degrees or so, so the driver can easily get in. Mm -hmm. And it's supposed to lock while it's driving. Well, it would just- It would move while driving, they were it driving. Move and, oh. So he went after the, uh, the shop that had uh, charged him to have all this work done and was able to recover a, a big part of the, the money based oh, on wow. it. This actually went to trial and so forth. Uh, that's a scenario that I would never thought. If you had someone restore your car, mm -hmm. they didn't do it correctly, and now you need an appraiser to come in to value what they did wrong. Yeah, I mean, I, in this case, I remember the judge saying, now, how's that steering wheel supposed to work? And I would describe it to him. And <laughs> so you were the subject matter expert in that <laughs> yeah. trial. Wow. Not my favorite thing to do, but mm. here's another fraud case. This uh, nice Dodge Challenger had been restored, but it had lots of problems. Body panels were on right, overspray, scratches in the paint, uh, some wrong parts put on. And it was, again, I think he'd spent like 38000 to have it restored. And he was, again, able to recover a lot of that. Mm. Let's see. Oh, the next one. This Here's a Lamborghini Diablo. So. Ooh was called by an attorney, his client had purchased the car in the upper left photo. And it's actually taken, photo taken in an impound lot because right after he tried to title it uh, in the state of Maryland, 
the police saw the VIN number come up and they identified the VIN number as going to this car in the, on the right side with the red body Ooh. that had been in a bad, bad fire. And when they, they brought me in to determine uh, what was original on this car and what VINs should they have gone with, and I was able to identify a lot of the parts that did have some good identification marks. Actually, we figured out that the VIN was from the burned car and the parts were from two other cars that had been stolen. Oh, so, wow. um, it, yeah, it was, uh, it was a sad case for this buyer because he spent, I think, $103,000 on this thing. Wow. So he bought from somebody who put together that car. Exactly. Ooh. Yep. So what happens to that car? Well, uh, it, it was, it, it, the attorneys kind of fought it out. I think the guy ultimately got it, and I think they went back. They determined who had sold it to him mm -hmm. and who had done this work. It was somebody in Chicago and they went after them uh, ultimately yeah okay. um, here's a non-original corvette it was represented as an all-original accident free car and by looking at it and looking underneath you could tell a lot of the body panels were not original they hadn't been attached the way the factory would have done it mm -hmm. the uh, i think it was a small block and it's got a big block hood on it and uh, some of the parts weren't accurate and so forth so so were you brought in to help figure out the difference in value and try to get that money back for the buyer? Oh, or just help the buyer determine if, if they should pay what was being asked or not. And, ah, okay. and really what was it that was being advertised? Was it accurate or not? Hmm. Uh, I was going to go on to diminished value and some examples of diminished value. Can we answer a couple of questions but from was, our viewers? Yeah, I was just going to yeah, say, let, Before we get into that. the diminished value, we've got... Um, a number of great questions here and I'll start with the question we always encourage our members to drive and enjoy their cars Indeed. but Lance Johnson is wondering what's the value impact from taking your cars on multiple HPDEs he in his case he has a 2016 uh, GT4 with about 10 events a year for the past three yeah. years well I, I agree with what you just said Vu. we we want these are vehicles to be driven and enjoyed and most of the fun comes from that uh, but re recognize that when you do these and you start to get stone chips and, and if you mix it up with somebody on the racetrack and so forth, it's definitely going to have a, an effect on the condition, which is going to affect the value. Yeah, but nothing is more priceless than having a smile on your face. You That's know, right. Third gear to red line, right? <laughs> and, uh, as soon as you get that passing signal from somebody. Right. <laughs> All right, Don C. Uh, writes in, does a certificate of, uh, certificate of authenticity affect the value? Yeah, it's nice to have that. I, buyers like to see that. Uh, it's certainly helpful to me when I do an appraisal to see what was originally on the car and if those things are still there. I always uh, put a copy of that in the appraisal report and um, because I, I think it, it just shows that the car is original and hasn't been monkeyed with. Okay. Uh, Mark Harris writes in, how does Carfax slash AutoCheck get their information and how do they determine minor versus more substantial damage? And I'll add to his question, how does it affect the yeah. valuation? Well, they, they get their data from lots of sources. Uh, insurance companies typically report any accident history to those companies. Body shops do. Um, individuals can. Um, and by the way, even if it doesn't have a Carfax listing your required by law to disclose any accident damage a car may have. Mm -hmm. But uh, so it comes from a variety of sources, primarily those couple that I mentioned. Um, also all the, the state inspection uh, bureaus uh, put in, input to those sources. Uh, maintenance work goes into it. So there's quite a bit of data on each car typically. Uh, it definitely affects the value. Uh, oh, and, and then the second part of the question was the accident severity. Mm -hmm. So they typically look uh, at kind of where it was hit, and what part of the car, the, the Carfax report will you know, point to front, corner, front, side, yeah. and so forth. And I think they also look at the value of the repairs, and they just make a, a pretty rough assessment on its uh, severity. Yeah. And in many cases, I find where I... When I do diminish value, if I have a Carfax report and, and it's been reported, it takes about three months for it to show up sometimes mm -hmm. after the accident. But it doesn't seem to correspond well to the severity of the repair work. 
you know, if it's frame damage, airbag deployment, things like that that have a big impact on uh, diminished value. It, and it, sometimes I see, you know, minor accident and it'll be, you know, fifteen thousand dollars worth of repairs and typically that's more than you know somebody tapped you in the back end <laughs> so you, you you said something about it takes about three months for it to show up on carfax let's say an unscru unscrupulous person gets into an accident gets the car repaired and gets it repaired within a month that's right puts the car for sale you run a carfax on that car doesn't show any accidents, even if it was reported, because you just said it takes three months to get into the system. You own the car, and then for whatever reason, six months later, you said, oh, let me run a Carfax on all my cars, and you run a Carfax on it, and lo and behold, now your car has this record. What's the recourse on that? Uh, probably not a lot. I mean, you can go back to the seller and, and try to get some recourse. I had a guy who bought an, an Aston Martin just recently, and it had some damage that wasn't disclosed. He Took, it was, uh, he bought it out of uh, a different part of the country, had it delivered him, to him, and it had some accident damage. And he went back to the seller and obviously, or, uh, obviously was able to describe this and then get some compensation. But a lot now of times you, now it's up to you to fight for it, right? Yeah, I mean, sometimes it'll, the Carfax will show up a little sooner, but I've seen them go as long as three months. Yeah, and that's why we always talk about having a pre-purchase inspection yeah, done because that way they will see and look at the car as of right now before you buy because six months later even though you find out now is it worth your time and energy to chase down the dollars that might be owed to you yep yep good point all right so uh let's see john peter kusakis when is it crucial to use one of the classic car insurance companies to protect your vehicle value i.e what year, what model should you seek classic coverage? So uh, there are a number of companies that, as you know, specialize in classic cars. Uh, Haggerty, Heacock, Chubb, there are a bunch of them. Mm -hmm. And all of the ones I just mentioned and most of the ones that really specialize in collectible cars will allow you to get this agreed value policy, which is, again, I think is really critical. Um, and they offer good rates. I just bought a, uh, a trailer to take a little race car around on. And my daily driver insurance company wanted uh, $352 a year to insure the, this against loss. And I went to Haggerty and it was uh, 87 So, you know, they, they tend to understand what we are as, as uh, car collectors and enthusiasts. And they have some limitations. Mm -hmm. You can maybe only drive at 2,500 miles a year or less. And you can't use it as a daily driver. And, you know, you're not going to be taking it to pick up groceries and so forth. But they understand that we're taking good care of these cars and they offer good rates for that. Yeah, and I think you just answered DG's question. Um, their question was, why does my mainstream insurance company for my daily driver so much higher than my 993C4S, which has a higher value? And I think it's just statistics, right? And, and the actuaries know that your classic car is going to be limited use. You're going yep. to take care of it differently than your daily driver. You're not parking it in a parking lot every day that, you know, where it could be susceptible to damage. So therefore exactly they're allowed, right. they're able to give you a better rate. Yep. All right. Um, here, oh, this is one that I asked you just yesterday. Christopher Davis <laughs> says, do you ever get into a disagreement over the value of the car? It doesn't happen very often. Uh, of the 1,270 appraisals I've done, I think just a handful, three or four even, where I've gotten into a disagreement with someone. And, and typically it's a case where somebody wants and expects a big number. And they may be looking at where they think the car is going to go in value, which may or may not happen. You know, the economy may sour and the value will come down, or it may continue to climb. Uh, I have to base this on data for vehicles that have been sold, that are for sale, uh, these valuation sources. And not speculation. And, and it can't be on speculation. Mm, got it. Yep. All right, so we're, we're coming up to the hour quickly. So yeah, let's go, let's go, let's go to diminished value. Okay, so diminished value, slide 29. There, uh, yeah, so there are a lot of factors that go into a diminished value calculation. We mentioned again that this is for vehicles uh, that have been in an accident that was not your fault and, uh, and there are kind of two sets of factors with this. The inherent diminished value is the value just because it's carrying this, re this uh, accident history, it's going to be worth less. 
and the severity of the accident is key and the value of the vehicle are key. So looking at the vehicle age, mileage, condition, its pre-accident value, what was it worth on the day of the accident before it occurred, and then the kind of repairs, cost, whether it's frame damage, structural, steering, suspension, airbags, the fact that a newer vehicle is no longer going to be certified pre-owned eligible because a lot of dealers or CarMax won't uh, be able to represent this as a CPO car if it has a Carfax uh, negative history. If it's a performance vehicle, so people who buy Porsches and Ferraris and Lamborghinis are going to be much more interested in a car that doesn't have an accident history. They're going to be a lot more discriminating. And some other factors. And then in the right column there, there are repair related diminished value issues. So if the most pair repairs are typically done pretty well, but if there are tape lines or overspray, seam sealer showing, body gaps, uh, parts that don't align well, no, non OEM or used parts if they were uh, used, if there are VIN coded part tags, a lot of cars have VIN coded tags on doors, hoods, trunks. And if one side of the car has them and the other doesn't, it shows that the you know, a door has been replaced or door skin. And if you've got a, a car that has all kinds of brand new replaced parts on it or tool marks on the parts, you can definitely you know, tell it's been repaired. So that all factors into the diminished value calculation. And if we go to the next slides, so here's an example of a Porsche I did a number of years ago, but it, its value at the time was $50,000. The repairs were almost $34,000, and the diminished value was uh, $7,900. Mm. And that's it, above and beyond uh, what the insurance company uh, covered for the repairs. This is a, a check. So that's, that's a total? Uh, the, the diminished value was paid to the owner of the car after it was repaired. Oh, it was repaired? Yeah. Oh. Yep, yep. It was all repaired for that $34,000 amount, nicely repaired, and... Uh, it looks great, but it's got this Carfax that says, you know, this came and was in an accident. I will say some insurance companies are easier to work with on diminished value than others. Mm -hmm. None of them are going to say, oh, would you like diminished value? You really have to ask for it. It is the law. Uh, but some insurance companies are going to want to negotiate, and some people just write the check and it's done. Yeah, because I've heard of people where they want to get into the whole diminished value and get a proper appraisal, but then that adds time to when you will get a check. Because a lot of people that get into accidents, they're going to need to get into their next car, and they don't have that time, right? I usually suggest people get the, uh, in fact, I always suggest that people get the car repaired, get all the repairs done, and pick up the car and have it, and then uh, submit the diminished value claim. Oh, okay. So they've got the car back. In fact, sometimes I, I need to see it. Not always, but, you know, I'll look for those repair-related uh, issues that would indicate that it's been in an accident that a, another buyer would potentially see, but uh, it shouldn't slow down getting a check on the repair work. Oh, at I all. didn't know that. That's something new yep. for me. And the, some states, the uh, statute of limitations is a couple of years, and some there is no statute of limitations on doing this. But okay. you, usually it needs to be done within a couple of years. If you go to the next one, slide 31. Oh, here's an Audi R8, $31,000 of repairs, had a clean value of 149, and the diminished value was $21,000. So wow. that's a check written to the owner. Wow. The next one is a BMW. See, the value of the vehicle then was 52. Repairs were 10.6, and the diminished value was uh, 49.50. So, and uh, the guy just got a check from the insurance company. Oh, it worked out well. So, in this situation where you're helping people figure out all these. Um, you know, values and such, how do you get compensated? Uh, I, I charge a flat fee. Flat of, fee, okay. Yeah. Huh. I charge 275 for a diminished value report. And I always kind of take a look at it ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And if I think they don't have a good case, then I'll say, look, it's not going to be worthwhile for you uh, to pursue okay. this. And oh, nice. Here's the last one. Here's a Tesla. I've done I, three or four Teslas that have been in accidents. They're very expensive to repair. Great cars. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of aluminum, a lot of panels that are attached with the fancy adhesives. The batteries require mm -hmm. special repairs. So the repair work can be pretty significant. Uh, and, and the Tesla, of course, is the one on the left. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it, it stood up well in this accident. But you can see the diminished value, and this was $12,000. So. Wow. Yep. So here's a question we have to ask before sure. we end the show. Now that we've talked about how important it is to know someone like yourself, how does one find 
uh, someone and, and uh, what qualifications should they be looking for? I think there are a number of ways to, to find people. Uh, well, the qualifications, again, I, I suggest people oftentimes try this on, on their own. You know, a lot of the insurance companies like Haggerty will let you uh, submit some documentation to say, hey, here are the values I found. Uh, I put them in this report and this is what I think it's worth and a lot of times they'll accept that without needing a professional appraiser. Uh, so that's why I was kind of stressing the valuation sources and how mm -hmm. to do it on your own. If you do need one, then uh, you want to find someone who is a certified appraiser, who um, uh, follows the proper procedures and so forth, ask for uh, their credentials page to see kind of what they've done and how they've been trained and what their experience is. You can get a recommendation maybe from an insurance company, a lawyer, a friend. I mean, Haggerty sends me some business every once in a while. I would say, they'll say one of my customers in your area needs a, an appraisal. You can do an internet search of vehicle appraisers near me and it'll come up with some. Uh, I, I think that probably is the best set of ways to do it. There are some, uh, there are a lot of ads in Hemmings for appraisers. There are some organizations like the International Vehicle Appraisers Network that I got my certification through that has appraisers around the country. And you can uh, search on that, they, and they have a tab that says uh, appraisers near me. So mm -hmm. I think those are the best ways. Would, would like the high-end body shops in one's area know all the folks like yourself? Yeah, I get a lot of referrals from uh, body shops and uh, uh, places that sell cars and classic cars and mm. so forth. All right. Well, let's take two more questions before we get into the administrative stuff. Um, let's see. From the speed four to three, value on DIY maintenance records versus dealer records. I, I'd suggest DIY people keep records. I do almost all my maintenance, and I keep pretty careful records so I can go back and show when I um, did anything. And I, I just suggest records in general are a helpful thing for, a, particularly a, a buyer is going to want to see those kinds of things. Okay. And last question from Christopher Davis. How much does a good car detailing and paint correction help increase the car value? Uh, it, it definitely helps. And, you know, if you, a, a buyer is going to want to see car a car. Nice presents shiny, well. Yeah, exactly. They're going to see a car that looks nice and shiny and clean. And uh, certainly when I appraise them, I, I see them in all kinds of conditions. And uh, it, it definitely helps to, to be able to see the car well if it's clean, but it, if it pops, it's going to help. Yeah. <laughs> so one final question from sure. me. Of all that you said, over a thousand appraisals, what's your most memorable appraisal? Oh boy, oh boy, that's a good question. Um, you know, I'd like to do uh, appraisals of cars that I grew up with that are my favorites. And so uh, definitely the Porsches, some of the Corvettes, uh, are always the fun ones to Those see. Those are the fun ones? Yeah. Because yeah. it's kind of in your wheelhouse, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But some odd cars. Every once in a while I'll see a, a really unusual and interesting car, and, and they're kind of a challenge to figure out, and that's fun too. There you go. Well, like I said, an hour would come up very quickly, but I do want to hit up some housekeeping items. For those of you that are near uh, eastern Pennsylvania and you're around February 24th and 25th, be sure to check out Tech Tactics East. Registration uh, opens January 17th. Uh, we have recently today sold out Treffin Wine Country. Registration opened today. We have Porsche Parade, um, actually before Porsche Parade, let's go to Works Reunion Amelia Island, March 1st. A registration is open. I believe judge cars are sold out. We have plenty of space in the corral, so make sure you sign up there. We have Porsche Parade June 9th through 15th. Registration for uh, round one opens January 31st. And we uh, came back recently from Treffin at Sea in the Western Caribbean. We already know where we're going for 2024, and that is July 28th through August 4th. We are heading to a bucket list destination of Alaska. Mm -hmm. We already have over 650 wow. people booked for this trip. So if you ever thought about going to Alaska on a cruise, and maybe you want to tag along with a bunch of PCA gearheads, <laughs> uh, that's the one to do. And for those of us here in the Northeast, and someone was talking about how they're getting some snow tonight, and you're not able to uh, get in, out and about and drive your Porsche, check out PCASimRacing.com. <laughs> and of course, if you're looking to kill time or just looking to listen to some cool information, check out PCA's podcast, PCA Insider. And with that, thank you so much for joining us. I uh, appreciate Thanks, your bro. time with us, Doug, and I hope you enjoyed the show. Until next time, we'll see you later.